camping in the deep woods and getting attuned to nature, to some sounds like an ideal day, to others it's a horror story waiting to happen, and you are about to find out why. It's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Number one. Last summer, my boyfriend and I went camping in some nature preserve in Pennsylvania. I can't remember the name of it. It was pretty primitive camping. No cell service, and we saw two other people there in the entire place. It was huge, so it was pretty empty. My boyfriend immediately said these two people seemed off to him right away. I don't know if they had anything to do with what happened that night, but I'll describe them. The first person was a woman, who had her truck parked off the trail and had the hood open. I don't really notice these types of things, but my boyfriend said it looked to him like she was waiting for someone to pull off beside her and offer to help with her truck. Normally my boyfriend is the type to at least offer to call someone, but he said that she skeeved him out. He didn't even want to draw her attention more than was necessary. The next person we saw drove by several times whilst we were setting up. He just kept driving by slowly and looking at us. I didn't even notice though until my boyfriend pointed out that he'd already done it twice before. Whether these two people had anything sinister going on or not, the real story has to do with what woke us up at around 3am. It was incredibly loud and sudden. I couldn't describe it or even compare it to anything, but my boyfriend said that it sounded similar to a chain gun revving up or someone using a large tool to scrape gravel. My boyfriend jumped up and looked out the little window of the tent. The sound happened again, again and again, and it was getting noticeably closer each time. I was about to piss myself, but my boyfriend told me it was probably miles off. I didn't question this because loud noises can be heard from miles away, right? Well, later my boyfriend told me that he said this to me in order not to scare me. It really sounded like it was coming from right down the little dirt road. At one point, he said he suspected it was right in front of our campsite. The only reason he didn't tell me to get out and dart for the car was because he would be afraid it would be someone trying to scare us out of the tent for some dreadful reason. When he whispered, I should have noticed he was whispering and knew something was wrong, since otherwise he would have just spoken normally, right? He would have told me to go back to sleep. However, I couldn't because every little sound I heard outside, I thought was someone sneaking up onto the tent. Eventually, my boyfriend told me to get out and help him pack up. It was about 20 minutes perhaps after the sound stopped, and he held onto our only weapon, a machete, in front of him. It was a full moon, so we didn't need a light, and while we were packing quickly, I noticed an empty beer can close to our dead campfire. It certainly wasn't there when we went to sleep at around 10pm as neither of us even bought any beer. Thankfully, we got out of there, and the rest of the trip we had a blast, and we either camped in areas well populated by the campers, or got a hotel room. Sometimes, it's just not worth the risk when in the middle of nowhere. Number two. My father is a logger specifically one who operates a tree saw, which is basically a giant machine that is capable 
of cutting down massive trees and cutting them to specified lengths, which means he spends a lot of time alone in the deep forest. The way my dad's logging crew was set up is that he would be told where he was supposed to cut down trees and he would go do that and be paid based on the amount of trees he cut, not on how long it took him. So my dad used to work 16 to 20 hour days constantly to try and get as much done as quickly as possible. And then the rest of the crew would come clean up the trees and ship them to the mill. He used to work around 50% of the time alone and the rest of the time with another tree saw operator called Rene. He would use radios to communicate back and forth when they were working together. So anyway, my dad and Rene were put on a new job site and about 10 days in, everything was going as planned but they constantly heard weird chitter chatter over the radio that was such poor quality, no words could be heard and whatever radio channel they changed it to, it followed them. As they progressed through the job and went further up the mountain, the words from the radio slowly became more audible. Both of them agreed based on the small parts of conversation that they could hear, that something was wrong. They also started finding weird containers all over the place and signs that people had been there. People should not have been there, as it was a two and a half hour drive up a mountain. They had to spend three weeks clearing out the road so their trucks and equipment could make it up. They came to the realization that they are in a very secluded area with people who shouldn't be there. And the worst part is they aren't scheduled to leave for about another week. They would only leave to refuel the truck with gasoline for matches. And they would buy supplies and sleep in campers. One day, Rene comes across a tent and calls my dad over. They investigate the tent and find one lone sleeping bag and a duffel bag. They investigate the duffel bag and find many pairs of children's underwear and things that appear to be a rape kit, like rope, duct tape, sketched images of children being molested, and photographs of children that appear unaware that they are being photographed. In the tent, they also find a small amount of food, which includes canned goods and an apple, which proved that the tent had been occupied recently because there was no mold on it. They are now alone on a mountain with, a best case scenario, is a really messed up individual. Rene instantly wants to get out of there but my dad, being the hardest working person I've ever met, insists that they need to finish the job and then leave. They decide that they will not talk over the radios except in case of emergencies and use it to see if they can hear anyone talking over it. My father and Rene are now in close enough range of whoever has been talking over the radio to hear the conversations between two men about collecting water and wood for the fire. Nothing abnormal, except for the fact that these guys don't belong here and that the tent is undoubtedly theirs. At the end of the workday, my dad hears them on the radio talking about one of them collecting brush for a fire. My dad then hops on the radio and attempts to communicate with them about what the hell they are doing. I believe he said, who are you and what are you doing here? After this, 
the conversation between the men abruptly stops and they never pick up. That night, Rene wakes my dad up and whispers for him to get his gun. Someone's outside. My dad has told me that the first thing he hears when he wakes up is the quiet shuffling of footsteps. My dad fumbles for his gun and finds it, but realizes that he doesn't have it loaded and has next to no idea where his rounds are and Rene has nothing. And the thought of calling the police is absurd for multiple reasons. They hear a jiggle on the doorknob and it opens. The camper is far enough off the ground to where you had to jump in and there is no ladder or footstool. It just stays open and neither my dad or Renee move. They hear scratching right outside the door though. And after four minutes of scratching, my dad can no longer take it and nods at Renee. He quietly gets up and walks towards the camper door. And the second he reaches it, he is met with an intense pain across his right eye and to the left of his cheek. He has been cut and falls to the camper hitting the ground hard. A man with a knife gets on top of him and he is soon being kicked in the top of the head by a man behind him. Rene leaps off the trailer and manages to get the man off my dad and my dad gets up and realizes that the second man without a knife is running away and the man with a knife is scrambling away from Rene and starts running alongside his accomplice. My dad and Renee get into the truck and drive to the nearest hospital to treat my dad's cuts and later report the events to the police. They both quit their jobs and two weeks later, as the rest of the logging crew was finishing up the job, one of them was found gagged, bound, raped, murdered and thrown into a ditch. No one has been convicted of these crimes. To this day, my father can hardly see out of his right eye, and the pupil is disfigured, and looks more like a cat's eye than a human's. He suffers from PTSD, and hasn't slept a good night's sleep since. Number 3 When I was a kid, hiking along a coastal national forest area with my friend and his dad, I went alone down an overgrown side trail to pee. I noticed a stench from the main trail that we figured was a dead animal somewhere that was nearby, but it was getting more powerful as I went a short distance down that side trail. I stopped at a tree to do my business and found some trash scattered at the base of it. A cardboard sign leaned against it that read, come and find me, with an arrow pointing further down the overgrown trail. At that point, the stench was so powerful that my nose was starting to burn. I couldn't pee, with my mind freaking out, with all the kind of images of what the hell could be further down the trail. So I went back to the main trail and didn't say anything to my friend or his dad about what I had seen until I couldn't hold my pee in anymore and asked his dad to stop again so that I could pee. When we got back to town, he called it in to the local sheriff. I don't know what they found, if anything, but I can't help but still imagine some suicidal man's corpse or a bunch of dead animals a budding serial killer slaughtered and arranged somewhere down the trail. Number 4 I was camping in Lake Tahoe with my family when I was 18. I stepped away from our camp for a few minutes to try and take a picture of this odd looking pine tree. It had all the branches shaved off clean at one side. I had seen down the trail a couple of minutes away, and I followed the trail, but couldn't find this enormous pine. 
I was sure had been there. I walked back and couldn't find the camp. Mind you, I was still on the trail. I was either walking in one direction or another, and we were camping right by the clearing that was in no way hidden. I walked back and forth for about 20 minutes and couldn't find anything remotely familiar. I had walked maybe a yard in either direction, trying to find the camp or anything that could lead me to it. I even took to yelling to get my dad's attention, but nothing happened. So I figured I'd return to my original starting point and wait until my dad came for me, but I couldn't find that either. It just seemed as if I were walking through invisible portals that sent me off different parts of the trail. After about 10 minutes of following this trail back and forth and ending nowhere, a little bit of panic set in. I noticed that the woods had become stupidly silent, not quiet, but silent and muffled, as if I were wearing earbuds. Then I heard the ocean, not the sound of water, but the actual thunder of big oceanic waves crashing against rocks. Only that sound and nothing more. Finally, I panicked and just booked it through the opposite direction. After a few minutes of running, I found myself in a familiar spot and then I made my way back to camp. To me, the whole ordeal seemed to take about 30 to 40 minutes tops. My dad actually told me that I had been gone for three hours and that he himself had walked after me and couldn't find me anywhere. Number five. I have been hiking since I was a kid, so I have a number of stories. The most terrifying one happened to me when I was 16. I just got my license and I decided to go on a three day solo hike. On my second day, I was stopping at a river to collect and purify water. When I was getting my water, I heard what sounded like a wind chime on the other side of the river. On the other side, I walked back about 20 feet and saw probably about a dozen small houses made of sticks, bark and logs. The houses were only a couple of feet big and I kept walking on a path that the houses were and it led me down a small hill. At the bottom there was a house made the same as the others but full size. Attached to the front were the wind chimes. From afar I saw animal pelts and I assumed the guy living there hunted them and just had the pelt on display. But when I got closer I saw they were whole rotten carcasses. I got out of there, grabbed my bag and hiked through part of the night just to get away as quickly as possible. I couldn't really sleep. I kept hearing the wind chime. I think it was all just in my head. The next morning I still had a whole day's hike until I got to the end where the rangers were. And when I got there, I told them what I saw and pointed it out on a map. They told me that they would go check it out, get rid of everything that was authorised, and if anyone was there to kick them out. They thanked me and left. I know some rangers at different parks, and I know they carry guns. I assumed they went there armed and dealt with whoever was building there. I haven't been back to find out what they discovered, and I don't want to risk it. Number six. I work as a park operator in British Columbia. I work the night shift as their security and collections guy. One night, it was fairly overcast and super dark. I was parked at the bottom of the road leading down to the campground. I had the windows rolled down and was playing around on my phone as my shift was almost over. Suddenly, out of my passenger side window, I heard the sound of crunching footsteps moving around. There wasn't anything around that alarmed me, 
as we generally have bears in the area and other wildlife. I just kind of listened, as whatever it was, was walking around quite lightly on edge about it. Then the sound started to pick up pace, like it was running directly at the truck. It's pitch black, and I've got my hands up ready for something to jump through the side window of my truck out of the darkness. But just before I was sure it was going to make contact with the side of the truck, it just goes dead silent. So I said no thanks, and started up the truck, and zoomed up to the cabin to get away from whatever was going on there. So I'm already on edge to the max. I'm just thinking, lock the gate and go home. Yep, just lock the gate and go home. Well, prior to me leaving in my personal vehicle, I have to put the park truck keys away in the shop, inside this fenced off compound, which is just so conveniently unlit. So I whip out my cell phone, turn on the crappy LED, and started my way over to the shed. I'm trying not to freak myself out, but any little tick and leaf crunch just has me jittering at this point. I walk through the compound gate, and as I'm walking by the sort of multiple area, I hear this horror loud scream like an alarm triggering on. At this point, my body went into fight or flight, fists in the air, half about to crap myself. The sound persisted, and I recognized that it was the sound of golf carts when they are in reverse. But generally, you'd know if you left that on, because you'd hear the sound on when you parked it. So now my mind is thinking, okay, what the hell turned that on? So I sneak over there, slowly, towards the horror sound, scanning with my phone light scared out of my gourd. I run up really quickly, and pull the reverse lever off, while half expecting it to be some sort of axe murderer trap from a movie. But nothing. I literally toss the park truck key at the shed, and ran for my truck. Started it up turned on every single road light and backup light that I had, and locked the gate faster than I've ever done before. I even pathetically checked my back seat to make sure that my safe place didn't have anyone hiding in it. Trying to reflect on it does make me uneasy. Working in parks is great, but geez, the night shift can be really creepy. Number seven. I was camping with family over a three-day weekend. A few of us didn't have to get back to work, so we decided to camp an extra night. We had been a full campground, and it was now just down to us. It was my brother, his young son, me and my young daughter. At about 3am, my daughter woke up and said that she needed to go to the bathroom. She had to drop a deuce so there was no getting her to squat outside the tent. The outhouse was about a hundred yards away through the pitch dark campground, and the fire had gone out, and there was not really any moonlight. I got her up, grabbed a flashlight, and we headed to the outhouse. She did her business, and I stood outside the outhouse. I'd be lying if I said I weren't a little scared out in the woods in the dark miles from anywhere with my seven-year-old daughter inside a dark outhouse by herself. Luckily, she was quick, and we stumbled back towards the camp in the dark, with just the flashlight to lead us. The walk back was uneventful. We chatted little, and I tried to reassure her that we were safe, out here in the dark, as she had gotten a little scared, as she realized how alone we were in the empty campground. As we got to about 50 feet from camp, my daughter suddenly grabs my hand and whispers, Daddy, who is that? Who's what, honey? I don't see anything. That man right there, who is that? 
I shined the light where she was looking, and I couldn't see anyone. I grabbed her hand tighter, and picked up the pace to get us back to the tent, which was the only safety there was out there. And I knew that in this dark like this, we were really in trouble if there were some sketchier people out there messing with us. We got back, and I got us into the tent, and we got into our sleeping bags, and I laid there and listened for any sound outside the tent. Of course, there were millions of sounds I hadn't noticed before, and each one made me more and more terrified of whoever was out there. As she started to go to sleep, she asked if we were all right, and I said yes, even though I was completely freaking out. I asked her what the man had looked like, and she said he looked like a Native American. I laid there for what seemed like hours, until I couldn't take it anymore. I woke up my brother, and told him what happened. He is a lot more comfortable in the woods than I am, so he got up and got the fire going again. We sat by the fire until daylight, and nothing ever happened. The next day I asked my daughter about the man she saw, and she didn't remember it. To this day, she doesn't remember the event at all, and the area we were camping in is well known for being a historical place where Native Americans had lived and flourished until they were either forced into reservations or killed. Neither my brother or me found any sign of anyone being out there. If they had been walking around the woods, we would have heard them for sure. My only explanation is that she was so tired she fell back asleep and had a little micro sleep or something and dreamt it. But to this day, it still creeps me the hell out. Number 8. When I was stationed in North Carolina, we went to do our early yearly tear gas chambers, which is out in the middle of the woods. We did the chamber, walked out, and I go walk to the corner of the hooch to blow a massive snot rocket, because the tear gas clogs you up. I look up, and I see a big pile of shiny crimson and a brown mess. Naturally, I go take a look, and all it is is the innards of something large, just sitting there in a very neat pile looking quite fresh. There was no blood, no tracks, no evidence that anything had happened there other than a huge pile of guts. The area was kind of sandy, so there definitely should have been tracks. Shit was weird. About a week or two later, we went out to the field for some good old motivated infantry training. First day out there, we had a long night patrol to do. My squad sets out, with me leading. And not even 15 minutes into it, I stumble into an old foxhole. By stumble, I mean dropped like a sack of rocks thanks to all the gear I had on me. I felt like there were a bunch of branches down there, and I felt a couple of bugs crawl around me. No big deal, I'm used to it at this point. When a couple of my squad mates are helping me out, the fourth one shines his flashlight and everyone starts to flip shit and smacking the hell out of me. The foxhole was basically a brown recluse breeding ground, and I fell right into it. Yeah, not so used to that. After throwing my camis and gear off, and trying to shake them all off me, the guy with the flashlight looks in the foxhole and says, Holy shit. There must have been about a million spiders in there. And the bottom was filled with bones. Lots of bones. Number 9. My buddy Todd and I were camping at a small state lake in Kansas. The park is surrounded by farmland, with about a mile long gravel road leading up to it which then goes into the woods, 
and descends to the lake. As anyone who is familiar with gravel roads can attest, it's easy to hear someone coming. The campsite we were staying at was in the hills above the lake, and wasn't frequently used, but unfortunately is closed now. We are both light sleepers, and would wake up to a moose rustling the leaves near our tent. That night, we were up until some time after 1am, talking about the old days next to the fire, and we were asleep at around 1.30. We don't like to drink in the woods, because it dulls our senses, and we slept somewhere restlessly, and woke up to every tiny sound that night. Every sound, except one that would explain why there was a large bottle of baby oil squarely in front of our tent door in the morning. We both looked at each other in shock, and packed up our shit to leave, in case it was a threat of something to come that night. This second story also happened with Todd, but it was at a different campground. We used to like to renegade camp, which is a term we made up about camping places that we weren't supposed to be in. We'd choose a park that had a good chunk of woods and closed at sundown, park our cars in a nearby neighborhood, and walk in before the park closed. We'd set up camp, and after the park was closed, we'd have a little fire in our low-key camp, very good times. On one of our renegade camping trips, we were staying at the far side of a lake that was very rural. We had some friends drop us off during the day, and we walked deep into the woods near the lake. On this side of the lake, there was no camping allowed, and we hadn't seen anyone else at it. We didn't camp near the water because we didn't want to be seen, the woods were packed with locust trees, with those giant medieval torture thorns, and strung between those trees were ropes like spider webs, with huge face huggers. It made for some pretty uncomfortable progress through ravines. By the time we set up camp, we were pretty jittery from the hike, and a little bloody from all the thorns. When we finally made it to bed that night, we still had the creepy crawlies, and felt like there were spiders on us constantly, so it took us a while to get back to sleep. At around 3am, I was awoken by a hard, flat slap, right across the middle of my bare chest. I woke up shouting, what the hell? And Todd was screaming, spiders, spiders are everywhere, they're all over us and he started frantically trying to get out of the tent, whilst wildly swinging around to get the spiders off. He was brushing his body like they were all over him, and taking wild swings at his sleeping bag and mine. I was freaking out and flailing at everything, trying to get a flashlight to see what the hell was going on. He managed to get the tent door unzipped, and had taken two steps in his tidy whities and I started yelling, Todd, you're gonna run into the thorns. And then he stopped and turned around and slowly said, Mike, why am I outside the tent? Like, what the hell? You said there were spiders, I thought. And he replied in a very calm voice, they're gone now and turned and slowly started getting back into the tent. I'm panting like I'd run a marathon, and high as hell on adrenaline, as he calmly gets back in his sleeping bag. I shook him and said, what the hell, what was that? He acted like he'd just woken up. Turns out, I was missing one crucial piece of information. My friend Todd was taking a new medication, and that had the potential side effect of night terrors. After a few minutes of speaking about what had just happened, I calmed down a little, and then, off in the woods behind us, we hear, Todd, where are you going, Todd? 
You're going to run into the thorns, Todd. There was dead silence. We couldn't even breathe. We whispered to each other. What the hell was that? Then we heard the same voice from behind us at a different angle. It travelled several hundred yards left in a couple of seconds. Todd! I'm trying to find you, Todd! Where are you? Holy shit! What the hell are we gonna do? We can't run into the woods, we'll get destroyed in the thorns! We can't hide from something that can move like that. The voice didn't echo. It was just kind of out there. It sounded like it was 50 yards off still. There was no sound at all. Nothing was moving. Then, Todd almost gave me a heart attack by yelling out into the night. I'm fine. Go back to bed. And I slapped the shit out of him. We never got a response. We turned on every light we had, built the fire up, until it was about six feet high, and waited with wide eyes and pocket knives drawn for the morning to come. I've never been back to that park since. Number 10. Some buddies and I went camping by a lake one night. At about 1.30am, we heard some rustling in the bushes and just figured it was a rabbit or something. We went over to check it out, and found nothing. At about 1.35am, a huge pickup truck that was lifted and blaring loud music drove by on a dirt road really, really slowly, shining a huge police-grade spotlight on me and my friends. The truck burnt out and kept driving, so my best friend and I decided to drive up the road to see if we could spot anything unusual about the truck. We get to the main road and there are probably seven or eight cop cars, lights flashing and two or three ambulances. We stop to turn around and I swear like a damn horror film, a cop pecks on my window with his flashlight out of nowhere and he asks what we're doing. We told him we were camping and told him about the truck and he says, well you boys might want to camp somewhere else. We just had a triple homicide here and we haven't located the suspect. Friend says, so should we be scared? Like a goddamn idiot and the cop says, and I quote, well I'm not scared. But there are 20 officers here and we all have guns. I said, yes sir, and tore off back down the campsite. Best friend called the rest of our buddies and told them to pack up gear and not ask questions. And that we had to get out. We literally threw two fully pitched tents in the back of one of our trucks and got the hell out of there. The cops located the killer about 30 minutes later at our campsite. Number 11. When I was a teenager, I used to go camp out by myself. I had a spot that I liked, that was a few fences from my grandparents' house, out in the middle of nowhere. One of the places I cut through was a pasture full of cattle. Around cattle, especially cattle unfamiliar with me, I try to be very careful not to spook them, but otherwise cows are pretty easy going. This was about a mile from my grandparents' house, and probably about two from my destination. The one time I am thinking of, I slipped through the fence to find the cattle already freaked out. They were insanely agitated about something that I wasn't aware of. So, I stayed well clear of them as I went through the pasture. I had a good time camping that night and packed up next morning. As I went back to the pasture, however, there was this ridiculously bad smell. It smelled like a skunk had fought with something in a fertilizer barrel of shit 
and the barrel broke apart. It was awful. I tried to look around for the cows to make sure that they were not going to be surprised when I found them. They were just gone. There were some bushes and trees though, so I thought they were just out of sight. I kept walking through the place to go home, and it smelled so bad I set down my stuff at the fence line and decided to investigate. Well, I found the cows. All of them were shot and ripped apart. Someone had carefully shot them in the head with a bolt gun and eviscerated all of them. They had also dug a shallow ravine and piled the bodies in. It was horrible. I hightailed it out of there to grab my gear and my stuff was gone. As in, I set it right down here on this rock and it was within eyeshot. A quick glance showed me that there was not anything ripped or fallen out. I think Usain Bolt would have not been able to catch me on my way home. I never heard anything else about those cows and never went back to the old camp spot again. Number 12. I did my fair share of camping as a youth growing up in far north Queensland. We do it as teenagers to go pig hunting on big old farms on the tablelands. The farmers would pay us good cash to shoot some kangaroos and wild pigs, which can get into their crops in there. Anyway, me and three friends were doing a bit of pig hunting on a school holiday. We'd been out there for three days already and had two more to go. Bagged a fair share of ruse with the farmer who would pay us good money for them. So we were all having fun, enjoying the freedom of being young youths. To give you perspective, this particular farm was huge. Off-road driving could easily take more than three hours to get from one side to the other. It was really remote, and often you didn't feel that you were just on a farm, but someone's private land. The farmer told us that we were the only folks camping there during that time so to be wary of any strangers we came across that shouldn't be there. On our second to last night, we set up camp near a lot of trees, reasonably close to the river. Nice little flat sandy area perfect for campsite. We built a fire and settled in for the evening. We had a car radio, busting out some random tunes from a radio station that we picked up. We were talking shit around the fire and doing a little bit of drinking. That night's getting close to midnight, we turn off the radio and started to settle down, just talking shit about going back to school. And that's when we heard some voices. We're talking beautiful female voices, kind of singing off into the distance, kind of drifting on the wind. At first, I thought I was imagining it, but my friends all went silent and we listened to these voices that sounded like they were singing. There was a long pause of us looking at each other like, what the hell are we hearing? The voices were coming far off in the forest near our campsite, but close enough for us to kind of hear laughter and generally very nice singing. One of my mates is Aboriginal and I shit you not, he went as white as a ghost. He's dark skinned and he seriously looked white in the dark. I asked him what was up, and he told us whatever we do, do not go to check out those voices. Aboriginal folk have a lot of stories of these very long slender type people that live in the bushland, and they'll sing and talk to hikers and campers to lure them off the main tracks. People used to go missing way back in the Aboriginal history. So the elders, would always warn the community not to listen to the voices. Often they would call you when you were out hiking to come see what they'd found or for help. Some of the stories suggested that they would eat you. It was the first time he believed his eldest stories as the first time he had heard them, but he swore it's what his elders warned them about. Very, very 
nice voices sounding quite inviting. He seriously believed this. Me and my other mates were a bit disbelieving. We thought some young girls must have been out there having some fun camping with a bit of drink and were considering going out. As we were discussing it, the voices seemed to get closer and my Aboriginal friend told us not to speak to them and stay by the fire. He literally threw more wood on the fire just to make it brighter. We started getting pretty tense. The voices were around our campsite for about 30 to 40 minutes, easily within 50 meters of us. Now very clear, beautiful sounding voices. And sometimes I swear to God, I heard them say, come join us, but they went away. Next day, we looked around the area and we couldn't find any tracks at all. No fire pit, no signs that anyone had been around the area at all, nothing. We were pretty experienced at tracking animals and people make big ass tracks. I'll never forget it. We spoke to the farmer about the voices and he told us that they come and go as they pleased. He sometimes heard them when he's in his house and he also believes the Aboriginal legends. Number 13. So my uncle is an avid outdoorsman with a bit of hippie wanderlust. He did the Peace Corps twice, once in Kenya and another time in Egypt. He's seen some stuff, some creepy stuff in those countries, including weird rituals and the aftermath of some murders. Anyway, he's an outdoor guy who always was best friends with a Native American fellow and would hunt with him in the traditional bow and arrow style just to be closer to nature. Hunt and gather from the wild and use everything up sort of attitude. He didn't take the modern world for granted. My uncle and his friend hunted deer, mainly in Southern Ohio, in an area called Hocking Hills, which touches the Appalachian Mountains. A bit of the area's backstory. There have been years worth of reports of wild people living in the woods down there. Like people who go off the grid kind of deal. Also, talk of cults living in the woods. There's also a consistent rumor that people out in the worlds practice cannibalism. Rumor got invigorated by the reports of some backwards person coming into one of the local towns, smashing a bunch of stuff, and later being diagnosed with advanced mad cow disease, but for people. Basically, a misfolded protein starts multiplying in your brain, and it eats away in your neurons, making your brain look like Swiss cheese. Funny thing about getting prion disease, as it's called, is that you can get it by eating the protein of your own species cow eating ground up cow in their feed, or human on human cannibalism, particularly brain matter. Of course, it can happen when the same species eat each other, and then eating that infected animal and human can get it. But yeah, woods cannibals disease stories. So my uncle and his buddy are taking advantage of a brilliant full moon and a clear night to go out and set up to hunt some deer in Hocking Hills. They hike way out into the deep woods late at night and set up their perch and hut high up in the trees near a pine grove clearing. So they'll have some good visuals of the ground below. Inevitably, my uncle has to do what nature calls and leaves the perch and hikes out a bit to do his business just to prevent animals getting wind of the human scent. This is now in full moonlight, so my uncle feels pretty confident where he's going and where he came from. Then, a random cloud covers the moon and it's totally dark, and he made the mistake of not having a headlamp with him. So he waits until the cloud moves along, or until his eyes adjust, and then he hears the screaming. Not just screaming, but like laughing screaming and very, very human sounding. 
like the closest thing he said was that it was circling hyenas on the savannah that he remembers in Kenya, but also blood curdling, like make your veins turn to ice, just out of absolutely nowhere. And this is in Ohio. So he bolts, runs like a crazy person back to where he thought he came from, ducking under bushes and hiding behind rocks. When the laughter slash screaming sound gets closer, Again, this is a guy who's seen some pretty messed up stuff overseas, and he's tumbling and fumbling over himself trying to run away. So the moon comes out again, and my uncle finds himself in the pine grove clearing near where his buddy is. Quiet, then more screaming. He's like F cannibals, and finds the tree where the perch is at. And bare finger climbs up that damn tree, like his life depends on it. Fractures a bunch of his nails, and the buddy is still up there in the perch. My uncle is freaking out. He tells his buddy that the cannibals are here, and that they're totally screwed. His friend just laughs at him. He tells my uncle that the sound he's been hearing, the laughing slash screaming, is the sound of deer and heat and getting it on. Like a bunch of deer doing it everywhere. That it's super rare to be able to hear, and that they're lucky to experience it. I think I heard that my uncle wanted to punch his friend, but they laugh about it instead and talk about the good spot and that they'll likely get a buck that night with all the activity, although they appreciate just how much that's going to suck for the buck. All of a sudden, a whole group of deer trot into the clearing. My uncle and his friend get ready to shoot, but then all of a sudden, the deer stop and turn their heads in the same direction and then bolt like a stampede away. My uncle and his buddy are so confused, and then in the clearing come three or four people. They're carrying something that has the shape and weight of another person. Again, this is in the middle of the woods. They walk right into the moonlight, and it's like a freaking body they're carrying. They look like haggard woods people. They have dark, purple stuff on their upper bodies, and my uncle goes to ask his buddy a question about if they're seeing what they're actually seeing. But before he can say it, his friend shuts him up by covering his mouth. The people walk away not seeing the perch. My uncle says that his friend gets real serious and starts counting his arrows. After about 30 minutes, my uncle's friend tells my uncle that they must not sleep that night and not to make much noise then starts mumbling a soft native chant. They don't sleep, and no one returns to the clearing, and the sun comes up. Very sunny, clear day. They look around. There's nobody. It's very quiet. They make their way down to the perch, leaving most of their stuff in the perch because they want to get the hell out of there as quickly as possible. They get back to the truck parked alongside the road and head immediately to the nearest ranger station to tell them what happened. They both get the breathalyzer because yeah, the story could have totally been the product of one too many Budweiser lights, but they're stone cold sober. They convince the ranger that something went down. A few rangers then go with them back to check the clearing out and for my uncle to get his gear. While my uncle and his friend are packing up the area, the rangers walk into the area, and then all of a sudden, they all get buzzing. My uncle goes to see what's up, and the ranger found a few blood spots that look like a blood trail. They do a spot check of the blood with their gearbox, and determine it's not deer, but rather human blood. My uncle's like, well forget this, we're going to leave the ranger in order for them to radio the station. So fast forward later that day when my uncle and his friend are back home relaxing a bit after the ordeal. Both guys are fastidious and clean everything to put away. And then my uncle said that his friend just stopped dead cold and then looks at him. He tells my uncle that he began the night with two quivers with six arrows each. He now only has nine arrows. There are three missing. He for sure counted 12 when he recounted in the middle of the night, 
and shit went down. In their haste, they left the hunting gear all the way up the perch when they got down in the morning, but it was secure, like everything strapped into quivers and then strapped in the perch. So someone must have been watching them that morning and taking the arrows when they left. My uncle's friend promptly got rid of his bow and arrows after that, saying that he can't have them around anymore due to bad spirits. Even did a ritual with some of his tribe and my uncle, as they touched dark spirits and had to be purified. We later learned that the blood ended up matching some missing persons case. My uncle and his friend were questioned again. They never found any kind of human remains anywhere near where the blood was originally found there. They even brought in dogs from what I heard. Said missing person never became found again either. My uncle was told that a possible homicide can't be proved or considered because it was just him and his friend in the dark one night from far up in some trees. Besides that, there was no evidence found. That's why there wasn't any crime. So, mystery. But my uncle is convinced that what he heard that night running back from when he went down to go to the toilet was probably more than just deers doing their thing. Suffice to say, that was the last time they went into Hocking Hills Woods for deer hunting. They were also banned from considering going to Hocking Hills for family day hikes. To this day, I'm super wary of hiking anywhere in the Appalachians. Number 14. August 18th, 2016. I started a trip on the Allagash Waterway with my Boy Scout troop. We are located in Hampton, Maine, which is a fair distance south of the waterway. We started our trip in a small brook that led into Eagle Lake. It was my first time on the Allagash, and being the only rookie, I was placed with the most strong and experienced paddler, Connor. Our canoe was almost always in the middle of a group, which meant we had to keep good pace and my arms were getting tired quickly. In the woods on the bank of Eagle Lake sat two steam engines, the ghost trains of Allagash. The real story behind it had nothing to do with ghosts. The Allagash was a popular waterway used for logging and after the logging stopped, the two locomotives were left to rust and break down. It was a really neat experience to see those trains, even after their glory days. For nearly an hour, we climbed on those trains, a little wary of the rust and weak points where the train had been eroded away, and soon enough, we proceeded to make our way across the lake. After paddling for another long while, we decided to line up our boats and motor across the rest of the lake. Our canoes formed a giant fiberglass snake that travelled slowly but easily. I even began to doze off, only to be awoken by a sudden jolt. The boat in front had stopped, causing us to crash up against it. The scout in the stern seat turned, watch it. He shook his paddle above his head, splashing me with the grimy lake water. We all resumed paddling, and not long after we reached our first campsite. I set up my tent that I was sharing with my friend Aaron, and without even waiting until dinner, I fell asleep. The next morning came early, it was 5.30, and I was up packing away the tent. Aaron, after arguing with me, was now sleeping in the wet grass. I skipped breakfast and immediately went to packing my canoe for the trip ahead. The day was normal. We just paddled along until we reached the Chase Rapids, where we unloaded our gear into a trailer and then rode down the rapids in our considerably lighter canoes. We then stopped for lunch and continued down the river towards our next campsite. But that night got weird. We all sat on the banks, watching and shooting stars whizzing through the sky. The lack of light pollution allowed the night to show its true colours. 
Mixtures of purples and pinks and blues blanketed the sky, with millions of stars piercing through it. At near ten o'clock, everyone retired to their bedrooms, and snoring commenced. I stepped outside my tent, debating whether I should risk waking Aaron and facing his wrath, or just joining someone else's tent. I turned, looking for a tent that would be big enough for three, when I noticed something. There was a star that appeared to be moving, not fast like a shooting star, but slowly and growing in size. I stood in shock as the star stopped, hovering almost directly above me. I reached up, expecting my hand to go through it, like a beam of light, but the star was solid and ice cold, as if I had just rolled out of a freezer. I could now see it was more of an oval shape glowing white. A large beam of light surrounded me, and I felt a strange tingling sensation in the back of my neck. I felt myself being lifted from the muddy ground, and I could feel my body being absorbed into the oval like a water in a sponge. I found myself in a dark room, and a thick mist filled my nostrils and mouth. It stung my eyes and lungs, and my entire body went numb quite quickly, and I blacked out. I awoke in a room that was completely white. It was entirely well lit, but I couldn't identify a light source. My ears were ringing, and my eyes were straining painfully. I was laying on a slab made of cold metal, and I was staring at the ceiling. I was paralysed and cold. The ringing in my ears got worse and worse until it was nearly unbearable. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw something that haunts me to this day. Sliding slowly towards me was a hideous creature. It was completely brown with a large head. Two large black eyes were bulging from its face. It had two pinhole nostrils, and beneath them, multiple folds of skin that may have been covered by some kind of mouth. The monstrosity had an arm protruding straight from its chest region. At the end of the arm was a large hand that included four fingers. When compared to a human hand, I would say it had two thumbs and two pointy fingers. The fingers were pointed straight out. I later found out that they bent into a knuckle on one hand. It had four long, thin legs that dragged behind it, and it moved towards me. As it approached me, the ringing got progressively worse. As it slowed and leaned over me, I saw that in its hand, it held a long needle-like tool. The creature put the needle in my mouth, and that's when I lost all consciousness. When I awoke, I was laying in about a foot of water, in the shallows of the lake, and I couldn't remember a thing. We paddled all day as if nothing had happened, and it wasn't until that night the memory came back. One of the leaders told me a story about aliens, and then everything became clear. I don't have any intention of going back into the woods ever again. Hey guys, it's Mort here. 